Hello, and thanks for tuning in to Hand to Hand in the Trenches, a missionary story podcast. I'm Caleb Hickam. And I'm Kimberly Croker. And we are your hosts for this episode of Hand to Hand. Hand to Hand is a ministry outreach of Charity Baptist Tabernacle in Amarillo, Texas. And Hand to Hand is a missionary story podcast that tells the true stories of Christians around the world who have hazarded their lives for the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Hello there. Thanks for tuning in. Today we will be finishing the story of John Birch, missionary to China. John became a captain in the United States Army and worked for General Chenault, commander of the famed Flying Tigers, as an intelligence officer during World War II. Now, God guided John to this position because General Chenault allowed John to continue visiting and preaching in Chinese churches along the way while he was on his missions. In this way, he was still able to do what God had called him to do in China while at the same time serving his country. That's right, and he was a major factor in the U.S. and Chinese victories in China, which tied up a one million man Japanese army that otherwise would have been in the Pacific, wiping out MacArthur's armies. John was sent on many dangerous missions, most of which were behind enemy lines. He was sent to set up radio alert systems using patriotic Chinese. Many of these spotters and radio men came from churches that John had preached in because he knew that he could trust these men. So, let's get back to the story. It's now early 1944, and while waiting for his next mission, and more radios and equipment, John was spending more time with the nurses in Changsha. John met a Scottish nurse who was working for the British Red Cross. He felt that the life that God had called him to live as a missionary in war-torn China would be too hard for a wife. But when Marjorie Tucker introduced John to Jenny, he was swept off of his feet. I'm so happy to meet you. How long have you been in Changsha? For several months now. It's quite strange that we haven't met before. Strange? I think a better word would be tragic. Jenny had been around many flirtatious American soldiers, so she didn't realize that John was more serious than all of them. They talked for a long while, telling how they each had come to be in China. My parents were Baptist missionaries here with the China Inland Mission. My mother died some years ago and my father remarried. I guess you might say I'm an old China hand. Really? My parents were missionaries too. I was born in India, but we had to go back to the States when I was two and a half years old. After that, John and Jenny saw each other almost every day for the next two weeks. And by the end of the month, They were talking about engagement. John wrote to his sister, Betty, and told her all about this new girl he had met. He said in the letter, I think she loves me, and I know I love her. I expect that this girl I will marry. But then their lives and plans were interrupted by orders for John to report back to Kunming. Jenny, too, was waiting for a plane to go to Kunming, because she was being transferred to a post in India. They hoped that they would see each other again, even if only for a short visit. But John knew that the chances of them seeing each other in Kunming was very faint at best. He prayed that they might be together soon, if it was the Lord's will. The Chinese 10th Army reported that the Japanese were massing a huge force in the Yellow River Basin of northern Honan province. The Japanese were preparing for a major offensive, 
It was clear that if they could break through the lines of the war-worn and beleaguered 10th Chinese Army, whose morale was very low, but not as low as their supplies were, then the Japanese would be able to link up with the force from the Yangtze Bulge and capture Changsha, along with all the eastern bases. In short, it would be a knockout blow to China. John was then ordered to attend a briefing with Colonel Smith and General Chenault. How many Japs are we talking about, sir? We estimate a half million, maybe more. I radioed General Stilwell in Burma about the grave danger we are facing. He said his intelligence indicated that the enemy troops in Honan didn't have the offensive capability. He said I was just crying wolf. I have cabled the president and asked him to cut through the red tape and increase our tonnage. Do you think it'll get here in time? I don't know. That's why we need some liaison teams in there to mark exact targets. The way things stand now, we can't afford to waste any ammo, and we must cut the Jap supply lines. That means you, Birch. We need you to set up a network of spotters along the North-South Pingham Railroad. That is where the enemy is shipping their supplies now that they can't ship it by water. Attacking their supply lines is our only hope of holding them back. When do I leave, sir? It'll take a few days to get your radios together. So for now, just hang tight. John was hoping to remain in Kunming long enough to see Jenny during her layover on her way to India. While John was waiting at Kunming, the spotters along the Yangtze River sent an urgent radio message. One of the spotters had been discovered by the Japanese. He was the first of John's Chinese operatives to be caught. And he had been captured, shot, and then quartered with the sword. We have got to help his widow. Well, Birch, what do you suggest we do? Deposit $5,000 in the Changsha Bank in her name. Then let the other spotters know about it, so that they all know we'll take care of their families if anything happens to them. Good thinking, John. I'll secure the money. John wrote to Jenny while he was waiting for all the supplies he needed for his mission, and he said, I expect to be poor in money and material possessions all my life. But to be rich in the joys that come from God's love, man's love, and the world of nature? Please tell me if, in light of this, it lies beyond my power to make you happy. Jenny was on standby for over two weeks waiting to get to Kunming. She wrote to John almost every day, even though she didn't know if her letters were even getting to him. She thought he was probably a thousand miles away on a dangerous mission somewhere. She finally made it to Kunming on March the 23rd, but couldn't find John. She was eating in the dining room at the British consulate when she realized someone was standing over her. She looked up and saw John beaming down at her. I just missed you at Quellen, and I'm leaving again tomorrow. I'll likely be gone for several weeks, so we only have a few hours. Oh, but that's so much better than not seeing you at all. They talked together for quite a while, and then started walking in silence. They were both thinking that before long, they would be apart for a very, very long time. You, you can come visit me in India when you're on leave. The world is such a mess. Should we even bother to make plans for the future? They sat together, silently watching the moon rise, when finally, John began to pour out his heart. Jenny, I've wandered away from the Lord. Meeting you has started up a new flame, a new love for God's work. I understand, John. I have wandered away, too. I think maybe it's the war. Being with so many people who have no concept of what being a Christian really is. The living conditions make it difficult to have any alone time with God. The war... The war just seems to stretch on forever. The bombing and killing 
I'm just ready for it to be over so I can get back to what God has called me to do. You will, John. I know you will. But it will be different, though. I want to be on my own and not dependent on any mission board, just the Lord. I want to preach the gospel and start churches. One thing I've learned during all this violence is how to organize and handle men and to achieve difficult tasks. I'd love to use that ability for the Lord. In any case, I'm sure I'll always be poor and not have much to offer. You know how it is, being raised in a missionary home. Oh yes, I know. I was always afraid of being a missionary's wife. I saw my parents scraping and saving for me, and I vowed my life would be different. Yet I always knew money wouldn't bring happiness. Although there wasn't much money in our house, our family was always tremendously happy. Jenny, with all that I've told you, would you still marry me? John, I'd rather be poor with you than rich with anyone else in the world. Whether thou goest, I will go. They prayed together about having let their hearts drift away from the Lord and asked for His will and direction in bringing them together again. That night, John wrote a letter to his family and told them of his good news. When he had finished the letter, he wasn't feeling well. He felt hot and feverish, and there was perspiration running down his back. He went to the infirmary where the nurse took his temperature. It was 104. The next couple of days were a blur. At times, he thought Jenny was there, but he couldn't be sure if he was dreaming or not. By the time he was feeling better, she was in India. John was concerned whether they should get married or not. He was torn. He was so happy when he was around her and when he received her letters, but he was also afraid, afraid that the mission life he would live after the war would be too hard for a wife. While he was waiting to be released from bed, they wrote many letters to each other. John also received a letter informing him that his friends, the Donaldsons and Wells, had been included in a prisoner exchange and were back in the United States. However, dear old Mother Sweet had died in the internment camp and had been buried in the land that her and her husband had loved. This news broke John's heart. John then wrote a letter to Jenny and told her that he didn't feel that the marriage was God's plan for them. He didn't think it was right to ask her, or any woman for that matter, to endure the privations of existence in the wilds of China, Turkestan, and perhaps even Tibet. Then he wrote a letter to inform his parents. He told them that he still cared for Jenny so much, but he needed to return to his old creed of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And he asked God to make him stronger as a good soldier for Jesus Christ. After John got out of the infirmary, he reported to Colonel Smith. They reviewed the assignment, and afterwards, John hung around, as if he didn't want to leave. Is there something bothering you, John? Can I do anything? No. No, sir. It's done now. Though sometimes I wish it wasn't. I've broken up with my fiancé. John, I had no idea you were even engaged. Her name was Jenny, a British Red Cross nurse. Very sweet. I really love that girl. Then why did you break the engagement? Well, Colonel, maybe you can understand since your folks were missionaries. I believe God is calling me to serve him as a missionary in a field where no other missionaries have ever gone wouldn't be a place for a woman. No, I suppose not, John. I still love her, but I love God more, and he has to be first in my life. Did you know that no missionary has been able to live in Tibet since William Simpson was martyred in 1932? I couldn't expose a wife to that kind of danger and hardship. John finally was able to leave and catch up with the rest of his team in Changsha. This time, John was sure the Japanese would capture Changsha, 
and sent thousands fleeing westward. There were only 40,000 Chinese troops standing in the way of 500,000 Japanese soldiers. On his trip, John had to hide several times from passing enemy columns. On the railroad, he saw hundreds of cars filled with enemy armored vehicles, howitzers, and other war equipment. This really puzzled John because the Chinese communist guerrillas were known to be active in this area, but had not tried to interfere with the Japanese troop movements or even, at the very least, report any of this. It began to appear that the communists wanted the Japanese to defeat the nationalist forces in East China. When the Japanese began their attack on the nationalist armies, the nationalists fought valiantly. But they were pushed back by the sheer bulk of the Japanese offensive force. Colonel Smith threw every liaison team he could into the battle to call in airstrikes for the Chinese and General Chenault sent every plane that he could gas up into the fray, which sadly was only 150 of his 1,400 planes. The shortage of supplies was devastating. The Flying Tigers helped immensely. One strafing run took out 7,500 enemy soldiers on a treeless marsh. But there was no stemming the tide. On June 6th, the same day that the Allied troops are storming the beach of Normandy. The Japanese were halfway to Changsha, and on June 18th, Changsha fell. Ten days later, the enemy overran Hingyang Airfield. The defenders of Hingyang City held out for 49 days. But it wasn't a total defeat. The Chinese and the 14th had tied up a huge Japanese force for five months while inflicting heavy losses to an army that otherwise would have been in the Pacific Theater wreaking havoc on MacArthur's forces. By now, Allied troops were swarming Guam. American B-29 bombers were bombing Japan constantly, and U.S. ships had decimated the Japanese Navy at the battle. Of Lady Gulf. For John, this had been the longest, hottest, most miserable summer of his life. Then, Lieutenant General Albert Widmeyer replaced General Stilwell. General Widmeyer established cooperative rapport with both Chiang Kai shek and General Chenault. He pledged to give the 14th all the support possible. And he also sent General Stilwell's pro-communist political advisors packing. John took some Chinese soldiers and some radios and headed north to lengthen the intelligence net. He also carried his New Testament and Chinese gospel tracts. Since joining the force, there had been only a few Sundays that he hadn't been able to preach either to a Chinese congregation or to American soldiers. In November, some of John's Chinese agents had found an American crew from a B-29 that had bailed out way back in June. They had been in hiding in the mountains for all of that time. John's Chinese agents escorted their survivors back to a base that John had helped to build in a hidden pocket in the Yellow River Basin. Colonel Smith arranged for a C-47 transport to pick up the crew on November the 15th. That day, a very bad storm came in. No one thought the rescue plane would come, but John went down to the airfield just in case. The plane did come, and John was able to talk them down through the storm with a radio and a portable direction finder. All the men were rescued Later, John was asked how he did it. The Lord must have been with me. I couldn't see ten feet in front of me, but I got a fix on the plane and talked the pilot down. Then when the B-29 crew got on, I ran ahead of the plane and directed the pilot down the runway. They got airborne right over my head. 
Over the winter, many missionaries in the area came to John to be rescued. Some had been there for over 30 years and didn't want to leave. But now, after the Japanese invasion of the summer and fall had put them at great risk, they had no choice. John was told that they were not running a taxi service and that a transport couldn't be spared. So, John told them that he also had an urgent intelligence package. The transport was sent. John definitely had the information, but it could have waited for a few weeks. By now, Japan's fortunes of war were fading fast. U.S. Marines had raised the flag over Iwo Jima and were now pushing across Okinawa. In China, the 14th Air Force ruled the area from the Great Wall to Indochina. Thanks largely, in part, to the 10 air coordination teams that John had trained at Honan. The Japanese had been driven back from Cyan. The supplies from General Widmeyer had made all the difference. By now, the Japanese had already tried to surrender through Soviet intermediaries. But the Soviets were slow in passing along this information because the communists, both Russian and Chinese, along with their American sympathizers, were plotting to gain power in China. The communist Chinese were quickly moving into position behind the retreating Japanese army. They had even broken river dikes to flood and destroy the best crop that the nationalists had had in years. On August the 6th, the U.S. dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima, Japan. And on August the 9th, they dropped the second on Nagasaki. That Sunday, August the 12th, John preached to a full congregation. The radio man standing by for a message was the only man on the base who did not attend services that day. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us to the eve of victory. Lord, I've seen a Chinese brother beheaded by the Japanese for preaching Christ instead of the Emperor of Japan, and I've seen starving children whose meager rice was taken by the Japanese soldiers. Thank you, Lord, for bringing the war to a close. Now that the war was over, the Soviets and the Communist Chinese were moving to exploit the chaos and confusion so that they could receive the surrender of the Japanese and take control of the majority of China. The communists were cutting communication. They were damaging airfields and railroad lines to prevent Americans or nationalist officers from getting to the surrendering Japanese first. Although U.S. policy viewed the communist movement as an internal Chinese problem, General Widmeyer and the American military knew the potential danger to peace in China. So, on August 19th, John and all the other intelligence officers that he had helped to train were being sent out to try to get to known Japanese installations ahead of the communists. John and a friend, Bill Miller, were both being sent from different locations to the same city, Su Chow, where a large Japanese headquarters facility and airfield were located. Bill was a lost Catholic who John had witnessed to on many occasions, but who was still unsaved. That day they talked over the radio about the route that they would be taking to get there. John, I'm taking a boat down the Yellow River to Pingpu, and I'll catch a train north to Suchow. Why don't we meet up and travel together? Over. Negative, Bill. Negative. Too risky. I hear the commies are on both banks of the river downstream. They could shoot you, and nobody would ever find your body. I'm hoping for a plane to fly us in. It would be better for you to come to me. Over. Yes, but what if the plane doesn't come? Over. I have an alternate route planned. Over. Roger that. I'm going to take my chances on the river. What is your alternate route? Over. 
copy that, Bill. I will go on land to Kuta on the Longai Railroad and get a train east. Su Chow is only 95 miles from there. Over. John, you know the Reds may already be on the railroad. Over. Affirmative. I don't think they'll give Americans trouble if we're on a train where they cannot deny that they know who we are. Over. Copy that, John. Over and out. That night, John stayed up late reading his Bible. The next morning, John could not get a plane, so he assembled the group that was going with him to Su Chow. It included three other Americans, Sergeant Albert Myers, a radio technician, Lieutenants Ogle and Lieutenant Grimes, who were both OSS intelligence operatives. Also, there were five Chinese officers and two Japanese-speaking Koreans who were there to interpret. The entire group made it safely to Kuta, where they boarded the train east. They encountered no delays and made very good time for the first 45 miles. Then the train stopped at a little station. John and his men found that the tracks ahead had been sabotaged by the communists. They commandeered the locomotive and a baggage car to continue, but they only got 10 more miles before they found that several rails had been ripped up and carried away. A little bit later, a group of Japanese soldiers arrived on a hand car to repair the tracks. The Japanese officer demanded to know who they were and what their business was. I'm Captain John Birch of the United States Army. But in your position, sir, you have no right to ask about our business. It's late now, but in the morning, we will commandeer your handcart to continue on our way. So the next morning, they took a handcar and started down the track. About midday, they came upon about 300 communist Chinese who tried to disarm the group. But John, being in command, refused to give up their weapons. They were finally allowed to pass. Later, they passed more communists, ripping up more track, but once again were able to negotiate passage quickly. A little after 2 p.m., they made it to the outskirts of Huang Ko, where they saw a mud wall ahead with about 20 communist men in firing positions behind it. There were even more men in the railroad station nearby. One of the interpreters, Lieutenant Tung, went to try again to negotiate passage. He heard one of the communist officers saying to lock him up and to surround and disarm the others. Friends, the war is over. We had no more enemies. The Americans have helped us very much. I am with Captain Butch on a special mission to Su Chow. You had better not disarm an American. When the communist officer accompanied Lieutenant Tung back to John and the group, Tung overheard orders for the communist to take a gun with him and, if anything happened, for the officer to kill Tung first and then the others. When they got to the group, John was very irritated and somewhat belligerent. Lieutenant Grimes tried to calm John down. What are you, bandits? You communists act like a bunch of bandits or highwaymen. The communists told John and his men that because they were unwilling to disarm, they could continue, but they would not be responsible for what may happen to them. This was spoken in a nature of a threat. John and Lieutenant Tung both realized that they would pass and be shot in the back. John asked to see the commanding officer, so they were taken into a house and told to wait. Then finally they were taken out and led all around town to many different places where they never found the commanding officer. Finally, about 20 army soldiers began walking along their flanks. Then the officers ordered for the men to disarm John. 
Please wait. Do not try to disarm Captain Butch. If you want his gun, I'll get it for you. Otherwise, a serious misunderstanding may develop. Then, suddenly, the communist officer pointed to Lieutenant Tung and ordered for him to be shot first. They fired a dum-dum bullet into Tung's right thigh, just above his knee. Now a dum-dum bullet, it flattens and expands easily in the human body, and they were unlawful to be used according to the Hague rules of war. Then they shot John in the upper thigh. He went down, and he was shot again a second time, and then bayoneted. The communist slashed and cut his face, probably trying to prevent his body from being identified. Lieutenant Tung was lying wounded, going in and out of consciousness, and was beaten badly. His face was bashed in by a rifle, which resulted in permanent blindness in his right eye, and his leg was later amputated. The second gunshot that John had received had been to the back of the head at close range, execution style. His body had also been burned. John Morrison Birch had been murdered by the Chinese that he had committed his life to trying to reach for the cause of Christ. He had lived a very dangerous life during the war, crossing enemy lines many, many times to gain valuable information for the Chinese war effort. So, it is tragic that John survived all of that and was killed by those who had pretended to be his allies. Ironically, John's body was recovered and buried by the Japanese high command at Su Chow. Bill Miller, John's Catholic friend, made the arrangements, so again, Ironically, the funeral was conducted by Catholic Jesuit priests who the Japanese had allowed to stay because they were considered allies. On John's vault it read, Captain John M. Birch, August 25, 1945. He died for the cause of righteousness. Brother John Birch died serving the people of China where he had committed his life to serve just six years earlier. It's sad that for many years, no one, especially not John's parents, knew the truth about John's death. You see, the United States government covered up the murder of this great American hero because they knew that if the American people learned the truth about how John Birch had been murdered, there would be no way to avoid a war with the communists. In the beginning, John's parents were even told that he died from stray bullets. It took many frustrating years and much investigation on the part of John's mother to finally know the truth about their son's death. But John died trying to free the Chinese people. The Bible says in the book of Acts, chapter number 26 and verse number 18 to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. You see, John died trying to free the Chinese people not just to free them spiritually from ancestor worship, idolatry, and hell, but also to help free them from the Japanese and communist oppression. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 6.